All right, we're in Psalms 4 tonight, so please take your Bible and turn there if you would. And uh, let me just help you to understand the circumstances of Psalms chapter 4 are uh, really the same circumstances that we looked at last week when we looked at Psalms chapter 3. And if you weren't here, I'll just help you to understand that this is a difficult moment in David's life. Uh, David is the author of these two Psalms, and uh, he has been in a, in a difficult circumstance in the fact that his own son has risen up, uh, not only politically, but in uh, literally physical rebellion against his father to take the kingdom. And uh, so David uh, is kind of in a situation where he's uh, running. He's left Jerusalem, and he's living uh, amongst the, out in the wilderness. And as we looked at last week, we remember that God obviously gave David great peace. And I want you to look at chapter 4, if you would. There are just eight verses here. And uh, as we read them, I want you to think about David being there in the wilderness. And as he's uh, making this prayer, the difficult circumstances of his life, and he's offering up this, uh, this writing to, to the Lord and certainly recorded for us so that we have it for time and eternity. The Bible says in verse number 1, Hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me. Hear my prayer. O oh, you sons of men, how long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? That word leasing is an old English word that simply means lying. How long will you seek after lying? And that word see, as we talked about last week, is just kind of bringing that thing to a crescendo. That's a really, uh, he's really coming at that one with strength. Verse number three. But know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed. And be still, Selah. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There be many that say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of thy countenance upon us. Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me to dwell in safety. Now, um, uh, again, when we think about this circumstance as David is running from his son, I would just simply say that David is away from a place of what we would call physical protection. In other words, he's, he's out in the open. He has no fortress to hide in. He's uh, living there kind of in the wilderness. And, and from a numbers perspective, things are not in David's favor. There are more with Absalom than there are, there are with, with David at this point. And, and from a human perspective, we'd simply say things are not looking very, very encouraging. And certainly, I, I, we, there's probably, you know, this is probably within 24 hours of the rebellion. So we're, we're looking at a time where David has left Jerusalem. Uh, the, the, uh, the psalm that we read last week is what we would call a morning psalm. It, in other words, David left Jerusalem. He slept the night. He woke up in the morning. He wrote that psalm as kind of a praise to the Lord. And those who understand these things say in Psalm chapter 4 is an evening psalm. In other words, David wrote this psalm perhaps the evening, that very evening after he'd written the morning psalm. He's now reading or writing this evening psalm as a, again, just a prayer before the Lord, before he pillows his head. And it just seems to me as I, I read that this whole psalm is just filled with encouragement, with, with, with faith, with just belief. Now, now let me say tonight, because I think all of us... Um, deal at times in our life with, with what I would say are harrowing and difficult circumstances. Uh, there's going to be turmoil in, in people's lives. There are going to be moments of difficulty that all of us will deal with in life. And it, it's an interesting thing that uh, when sometimes we, we think, we, we just have this idea, well, you know, as long as I serve the Lord, as long as I do the right things, I, I shouldn't have any problems. But it's an interesting thing when you study the scripture and when you see how life itself plays out, that many times we can be right in the middle of serving the Lord. We can be doing what God wants us to do. We can be right with God in almost every facet of our life and find that sometimes our walls around us, our world seems to crumble around us. There are times that, at that like David, we, when those things happen in our life, we need to learn how to keep the, the faith. And, you know, I think that God does some unusual things when circumstances in our life kind of play out like we find here in this particular passage. I, I believe he stretches us and he pulls us to a point of if we had not gone through that, we perhaps would not 
feel that stretching. We would not feel that growth. We would not sense that God was at work in our life in unusual ways. Now, I want you to hold your place here because I, I want you to see something. It really is stated perhaps, uh, well, obviously a little more eloquently, you know, a little bit later on in the Psalms, what I'm trying to say. So go to Psalms 107 for just a moment. Let me show you something. You're perhaps familiar with this verse, but uh, this really kind of states uh, in, a, in a different way what I just, just gave to you about how God does some things in times of difficulty. Look at verse 23 of Psalms 107. The Bible says that they that go down, go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters. These say the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. Now, now let me just simply say something to you. And we're, we're getting what I would call a, a kind of a, a, a parable, if you would, in this passage. Um, a metaphor, if you want to use that phraseology. But think for just a moment. He's saying now those people who who see the, the Lord work in a great way, they've got to go out and they've got to get in some deep waters. Now, now let me just simply say this, because sometimes we miss this. If your boat's anchored at the shore and you never got into deep waters, you're not going to see it. Sometimes we've got to step out in the deep. Sometimes we've got to stretch ourselves just a little bit. And, and it's when we take those walks or those leaps of faith where other people say, well, I'm not sure I want to do that. Well, then you probably aren't going to see the Lord work in, in great and mighty ways. And, and so he says here, I'm telling you that understand that those people who are willing to get in those ships and go into the deep waters, that they see the hand of God. Now, now notice if you would, verse number 25, for he, who is it? God he's speaking of, for he commandeth and riseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heavens, they go down again to the depths. Do you get the picture? <laughs> Uh, it's gale force winds. The, the, sea, the, the sea is stirring. The, the ship is, is, is being tossed about like a little cork in a bathtub as a kid slaps the, the, the water and that little cork is just going all over the place. And he said, these people, they go down to the, to the, to the valley and the bottom is that, that wave comes, comes up and, and then goes back up to the top of that wave. They mount up to the heaven. They go down again to the depths. Verse 26, their soul is melted because of the trouble. You think, man, where is God in all this? We're, we're at our wit's end. We don't know what to do. Well, what happens? Well, they, they verse 27, they reel to and fro. They st stagger like drunken men. And they're at their wit's end. They cry. They cry unto the Lord in their trouble. And he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh a storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them to the desired haven. Now notice what verse number 31 says. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. I'm just simply saying, I think in a time of, of difficulty, when we get out of that comfort zone and God leads us someplace and we're, we're right in the middle of it sometimes and it just seems like, man, it, this is not what I expected. This is not what I was looking for. I didn't think this was how it was going to play out. It seems like my world's crashing around me. Where's God in all this? And we cry out to God. We see the hand of God reach down and deliver us out of that time of difficulty. Then we get on the other side. and Hey, if there's a time to praise the Lord, that's the time to praise God. And so I'm just simply saying, I, I see that in, in this situation in David's life, it is a time of difficulty in his life, and he's looking to the God of heaven, and I think he's going to give us some instruction here in this great fourth chapter. I want you to see four things, four truths in this cha chapter. Would you notice, first of all, the closet of prayer? The closet of prayer. Look at verse number one. Hear when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me. Hear my prayer. Now, when I think of verse number one, I think about a man entering into that prayer closet. And by the way, all of us ought to have a place that we retreat to, a, a special place, a place where we go to, we get on our knees, get on our face before God. And, and that's a place that's precious to us, a place that's special to us. It may be in your automobile on your way to work in the morning. It may be in, the, in, in a bedroom in your home where you go and you close out the rest of the world. It may be in your basement. It may be a quiet place that you like to retreat to or go to. But you get alone with God and, and in that prayer closet, you go to the Lord. And David seems to be in that place. And David was, I, I would just simply say this was a time of trouble in his life. He was in over his head. This is one of the most difficult moments of his life. Can you imagine, as we talked about last week, I mean, it's not just a rebellion, but this is your own son who's risen up in rebellion and wants to take your life. Now, I want you to notice several things that David mentions in this prayer. Would you notice, first of all, that he mentions that God is his righteousness? 
God is his righteousness. Now, now, please understand, this is, I know this is Wednesday night, and I know that it's, on Wednesday night it's like you're preaching to the choir, but I, I, it bears to be repeated over and over again every time we have the opportunity to simply say, there is no salvation in religion, there is no salvation in our own ability to do anything good or, or right, to be accepted in the sight of God. If there, the salvation that is available is salvation that comes from the Lord. And David said, my salvation, I'm calling unto God who has produced the righteousness that I need in my life. And I'm here to tell you tonight, unless you've got a robe of righteousness that you cannot provide for yourself, that God has given to you, who's, who has imputed it himself to you, then you are lost tonight. You must be robed in a robe of righteousness that you cannot produce, that can only be received by faith. And so David said, I'm telling you, I know where my righteousness comes from. It comes from God. Then he, rem he remembers and he reminds God of past deliverance. Look at verse number one again. Hear me when I call, O God, my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Now, now, let me just, again, help you to see that just bears repeating what I said in the introduction. David is simply saying, I'm in a time of difficulty in my life. This is a, a, a deep moment. This is a, a hard place to be. But I also remember, Lord, I've been in other hard places in my life. I remember when, when, when I was standing down there in that valley as a teenage boy and I was looking at that big Goliath, that giant, and I remember how he bellowed and said that he was going to feed me to the fowls of the heaven. And God, you gave me courage. I remember how in that moment of difficulty you enlarged me in my distress. Well, I remember those years that I was running from Saul and I was running from place to place. I was in caves and God, those were difficult moments. And I, I remember sometimes I, he, I could almost feel his breath. In fact, the Bible says in, in the book of 1 Samuel that David said there is but a step between me and death. He could feel the, the breath of, of, the, of Saul upon his neck. And he said, hey, God, I remember you enlarged me in my distresses. I want to tell you something. It does us good every once in a while just to remember the deliverance that God has given to us in the past. I was meeting with our seniors this yesterday. It's what we call Senior Leadership Day, Senior Day with the pastor. And uh, I said to those kids, you know, it does us good, kids, to go back and remember the day of our salvation. You ought to go back and remember God's deliverance. You know what Psalms 40 says? I, incl I, I, I incline to the Lord and he heard me. He lifted me up also out of a horrible pit, out of a horrible pit and set my feet upon a rock and establish my goings. I'm telling you, we, we need to remember God's deliverances in our life. And, and really, when you look back over your life, you ought to be able to see some things. And so David's remembering, he's reminding God of his past deliverances. Then, he, then would you notice the rest of verse number one, he pleads for mercy. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. Let me just simply say, there's no greater place for a Christian to go in a time of trouble than to go to the Lord himself. You know, throughout the pages of scripture, we're, we're told, we're challenged, we're we're, we're um, really pressed as, as Christian people, as God's people, that in the moment of difficulty that we retreat to, this, this, to the Lord in a time of trouble. There's so many passages of Scripture. I, I, I simply think about Jeremiah 33, 3. And Jeremiah is in a difficult strait in his life, and he's in the prison shut out, up, and nobody has wanted to listen to Jeremiah and his preaching. He's a, a, a weeping prophet, and they've mocked Jeremiah, and they've laughed at Jeremiah. They want to they kill Jeremiah, and they place him in prison, and the Lord appears to him there in that prison. He says, Jeremiah, call unto me, and I'll answer thee. Show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I'll tell you, Jesus taught his disciples to pray, and he gave them parables about persistence in prayer. Look at Luke chapter 18. We don't have time to turn there tonight, but he told the story of a little widow woman who, who couldn't get a, 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 a response from an unjust judge. And that little widow woman, she just kept coming and coming and coming. And that judge said, man, though I don't care about God and I don't care about her, I'm going to answer that woman lest she weary me. And then he goes on to say, how much more shall your heavenly father do for those who love him? Paul said to the Thessalonians, when they were in distress, and they were a church that was in distress, he said, pray without ceasing. You know, we have a hard time with this because there are many times we'd rather go to talk to somebody physically than we would to go to the Lord in prayer. Now, I'm not saying we don't pray. I'm just simply saying sometimes it's easier when you can see somebody. <laughs> I'm going to tell you about my problems. I'm going to tell you how miserable I am. I'm going to pour out my complaint on you. You ever have some people like that sometimes in your life? Man, every time you, come, you see them coming, it's like, man, I'm going to go run hide. They're going to come bleed on me again, you know. And that, that's a terrible way to feel about people, but sometimes that's just the way some people are. I mean, they, they never seem to have anything good happen in their life. Everything's, you know, everything's tough and, and difficult. 
and all of us have had times of difficulty. And I, I got to tell you, I remember as a, as a young man sometimes when things weren't going very well. And I, every time I'd see somebody, I'd say, well, it's just tough. Life's tough. Life's tough. And I got to realize, man, nobody wants to be around a sourpuss. So you might as well, you know, get, get, get it settled with the Lord. Let him handle it. But truthfully, you know, one of the things we, we got to come to is the fact is that our prayer closet is where we're going to get the answers. Now, there's nothing wrong with getting counsel. There's nothing wrong with going and speaking to someone. There's nothing wrong with saying, hey, you know, I, I prayed about this and I'm, I, I, I feel this is what the Lord wants me to do. Would you give me some counsel in the matter? But I'm simply saying sometimes we don't do that. Sometimes we just want to talk to Brother Rick and Brother Pete and the pastor. We want to talk to Brother Jim and, 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 and whoever else we can talk to. But we never take the time to get along with God. John o. Rice said it this way. He said, we can do something more when we pray but we can do nothing more until we pray well that's good advice and so i see the closet of prayer in verse number number one would you notice in verse number two i see the confused people the confused people in verse number two he said oh ye sons of men how long will you turn my glory into shame how long will ye see love vanity and seek after leasing now i would just simply say that i believe that this particular statement is directed to those people who are following Absalom the, in, in rebellion and in other words he's the, he's kind of he's prayed to the Lord now he's saying you know there's some confused people in this whole thing these people had followed a, a wicked son of David a young man full of himself now now get a hold of this this Absalom was full of himself he had he had convinced the people that he had their best interest at heart Last week when we turned to the passage where, where these two chapters and even chapter 5 are really uh, is a part of this when we look back at that, we, we saw that Absalom was standing in the gates. You know, as people come in, he, he convinced them that he was concerned about them. Oh, that I was made a judge. I, I'd be concerned about your problems. I'd help you. There isn't anybody, uh, the king's not, uh, you know, he, he's not putting anybody in that position. But boy, if I was, I was here, I could do that. So he's convinced that these people, that he's got their own best interests at heart. But I'm telling you something, when you study this out, Absalom didn't have the best interests of the people at heart. He had his own best interests at heart. He wanted what he wanted. He didn't care about the people. And David saw that. David knew something that sometimes we sel seldom remember when we're going through a struggle, when we're going through a time of difficulty, when, when some people perhaps have risen up against us and they don't like us or they, or, or they try to make our life miserable. I want to tell you something. David knew something that you and I ought to remember tonight, and that is the fact that the battle isn't first and foremost physical. It is a spiritual battle. It is. I, I remind you tonight that the Bible is clear that the spiritual battle is bigger than the physical battle. I believe that this was more a spiritual battle than it was a physical battle. Sure, it was going to play out in physical ways. And certainly people would die in a warfare. But I believe that the spirit of rebellion was not put in the heart of Absalom by God. It was put in the Absalom by the devil himself. And now the devil is raising up and making life miserable for, for, for David. And I just simply say that this prayer, uh, this is why prayer is so essential. Because the, the, the battle isn't a physical battle, it's a spiritual battle. Go with me to 2 Samuel chapter 5 for just a moment. Let me show you something. You know, God had taught David this truth, I believe, in, in, in past situations and circumstances. W would you look at verse uh, 22 of chapter 5? David, obviously, is the king and the Philistines, the nemesis of Israel, has come up against them again. Look at verse 22. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. So, so David understands, okay, I, we're going to battle. This is going to be a physical battle, but I've got to have God's direction in this battle, and I need God's help in this battle. So, so notice what happens. And the Lord said, Now, David, don't, don't go straight at them. You, you come around from behind them. Notice what it says in verse number 24. And let be... In other words, when you come behind them and you're by the mulberry trees, and let be, well, now here's the sound of the going in the tops of the mulberry trees. Then thou shalt bestir thyself, for then shall the Lord go out from before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. Ooh, that's good stuff. 
Hey, hey, you know what? So often we enter into these conflicts. We get involved in these, these physical things and we fail to realize that what we need is the help of God in the matter. So we take matters into our own hands and we become confused people like these people who are following Absalom. If those people who had, had been followers of David had been a little bit more spiritual, if they would have perhaps fixed their eyes a little bit more on heaven, if they'd understood that, hey, God's in charge and not some man's in charge, I don't suppose that Absalom would have had a following. You see, it's not a physical battle, it's a spiritual battle. I, I remind you that David uh, knew that in 2 Kings, uh, or, or Elijah knew that in 2 Kings chapter 6, and we don't have time to look at that that picture but you go and read that story there's a picture there and, and certainly Paul knew that in Ephesians chapter 6 when he said hey we don't wrestle against flesh and blood we're wrestling against principalities and powers and rulers and spiritual wickedness in high places and so David the David understood these were confused people because spiritually uh, there was a, a warfare that was going on let me show you some common traits of the deceived would you look at that in verse number two notice he says O oh, ye sons of men, how long will you turn my glory into shame? I, I would just simply say to you, when people are deceived, when people are, are confused, they take the glory of God and turn it into shameful things. It's shameful what's going on in churches tonight. They turn the glory of God into shame. The things that are done, quote, in the name of Christianity, the name of Christ, are shameful. And I'll simply say, I believe they're because they're deceived. They're spiritually blinded. The, the blind following the blind. And, and, and it's shameful. Is it not shameful that we're living in a society today that says that the Bible is the, most, is the most dangerous book in all of the United States of America? Turning God's glory into shame. Why? Because people are confused. They're, they're deceived. I heard today that in Scotland, the, I believe it's the University of Edinburgh, they are banning the Bible from the dorms. Because it may be offensive to somebody who's studying there. I'm simply saying, how long, ye sons of men, are you turning God's glory into shame? It's almost, you know, I'm getting tired of this, this Supreme Court thing. I, I really am. I'm getting sick to death of the Supreme Court thing. It's almost as if you've got to be ashamed if you're pro-life. It's almost as if you've got to be ashamed if you're a Christian in this society and you have a little bit of values. You're the most wild-eyed maniac in the whole place. You know why? Because the world's going to hell in a handbasket and the people are deceived. David said, I want to tell you something. I see that deception here. Then he said, not only do they turn my glory to shame, but they love vanity. Well, you know, when people are, are deceived, you know what they're, they're after? They're after, it's all about a house. It's all about a car. It's all about a fatter bank account. It's all about a retirement. It's all about, you know, you know, getting myself situated so that when I retire, I can just sit back and take my ease and eat, drink, and be merry. It's all about like Luke chapter 12 where Jesus told the parable of the rich fool. I'm going to tell you something. I thank the Lord for a comfortable home. Thank the Lord for a nice automobile. Thank the Lord for nice clothes to wear. And I thank the Lord for a nice church building. But I've got to tell you something. We aren't taking any of this with us. This is just temporary. They love vanity. And then he says they seek after leasing or lying. Well, people want to be deceived today. Don't tell us the truth. You tell us a lie, we'll receive the a lie. Chasing after lying. So David said, I want to see the, I, I want you to see the confused people. Then, then, then thirdly, would you notice the counsel, the counsel to the perplexed. We have the closet of prayer. We have the confused people. Then we have the counsel to the perplexed. Look at verses three to five. David's giving them some counsel now to these men, these people who are confused. Look at verse number three. But no, you, you folks that are confused, you folks that have your eyes blinded, you followed this leadership of, full of themselves. I want you to know something. But know that the Lord has said, the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Well, what is it? Well, what is the counsel? Well, first of all, in verse number three, you have a, the, the counsel to a powerful relationship. It's a powerful relationship. Uh, the, the idea is, here is what, what people need is they need a relationship with God. And that relationship begins with salvation. Uh, you, the Lord isn't going to set apart sorry, part anybody until they are saved. And so the Lord said, he set apart him that is godly for himself. So it starts with salvation and begin, then, then leads to separation to be separate from ungodliness and wickedness, which means leads to sanctification, which means to be s accepted by God. 
We always, you know, it's, it's almost like the, the world and even worldly Christians want to put a negative spin on separation. Why well, are you just against everything? No, I'm not against everything. I just believe there's some things that I, you know, I need to separate myself from so that I can be accepted by God. I separate from some things to be accepted by Him. And so, so the Bible says here in, in verse number, uh, number three, hey, the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. You know, sometimes it's painful to be godly. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, it seems to me that David says, man, I, I feel like I'm kind of by myself in this thing. And sometimes it's lonely being godly. And yet to have God, not to have, maybe not have the people, but to have God, that's a greater relationship. And, and notice David's, David's statement. Notice again in verse number three, he said, The Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Hey, isn't that, isn't that a better relationship than anything else in the world? Hey, that, to know that when I call upon God, because I'm in fellowship with God, to know that he's there to hear me. That, so he gives a counsel to a powerful relationship. Then he gives counsel to a personal relationship. Look at verse 4. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Now, I think David's indicating here that some, all of us need to have some time where we're alone with God. Maybe if those people that were following Absalom had been alone with God and had sought the Lord more, perhaps they would not be following this young man in rebellion. Notice we're to stand in awe. And, uh, if, if we get a glimpse of God, we can't help but be in awe. Boy, you go through the Bible and every person that saw God clearly, when they got that vision of God, when they saw who God was, they said, whoa, it's me. Stand in awe. Why? That's why I'm so, so aggravated, I guess. When we try to make God bring him down to our level to the point that instead of seeing him high and holy and lifted up instead of saying he's the guy he's god we want to make him like the guy next door like somebody down the street like we sit down and have a soda pop with with god i'm gonna tell you something friend you're not gonna sit down and have a social drink with the lord jesus christ Amen. he is a high and holy god now if he was walking here perhaps we'd have him into our home to to dine but i'll guarantee you there'd probably be a lot of house cleaning before he got there Truthfully, truthfully, he said, stand in awe. Then would you notice, he said, commune with your own heart. Do some introspection. Look inside. Be still. Be quiet enough to hear him. Spend, spend, you know, we spend so much time listening to everything else, but so little time listening to God. I want to ask you, even in your prayer time, do you... In your prayer time, do you stop long enough in your prayer time to see if God may have an answer to your prayer? You say, well, you know, does that mean that I'm going to hear God speak audibly from heaven? No. But I think sometimes when we're asking God about things, I think if we'd stop long enough and just say, okay, God, I'm going to just stay here just a little while and just want to see what, maybe you're going to press upon my heart something. Lead me someplace where I haven't been. I'm going to trust you to get me there. To enter into his presence. Then, then notice in verse number five, we have a, a powerful relationship. We have a personal relationship. And then I want you to see in verse number five, we have a practical relationship. Offer the sacrifice of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Now, the lean of these rebels at this point, they, they weren't in a position to offer a sacrifice of righteousness. They had to repent in order to be able to do that. See, a sacrifice of righteousness meant that you were right with God, that things were right, and they weren't right with God at this point, so there needed to be a repentance, and then they could offer the sacrifice of righteousness. So David is counseling his rebels to get right with God and then offer this acceptable sacrifice. And, you know, David was simply saying, I want to tell you something, I am the, the God-ordained, the God-sanctioned king, so if you're going to be right with God, then you've got to get right with me. And so he said, I'm, I want to tell you that in order to be that to happen in order to offer this this sacrifice there needs to be a reconciliation here then would you notice finally the confidence in peril we see the counsel that perplexed but notice the confidence in peril verses six to eight i find in verse number six that the confidence in god presence there be many there be many that say who will show us any good lord lift up thou the light of thy countenance upon us thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in a time that their corn and their wine was increased. Now, the indication is that maybe there were some in David's camp that were looking around saying, this isn't looking too promising. Man, we may be in over our heads here. 
Maybe there were some long-faced people that David's looking at, and he's, in, in verse number 6, he said, Many there be who say, Who will show us any good? So David, obviously, he, his confidence is not in, in men. They were, they were pessimistic, wondering, maybe they made a mistake in sticking with the king. And i got to tell you, sometimes it's difficult to be positive when things aren't always going positive. You know, I, I don't want to make this a political service tonight, but i got to tell you, I think if there's somebody we need to be praying for as a, as a congregation, we need to be praying for our president. Man, I, it seemed like everything that this guy has, has tried is just, it's just coming down on top of him. You say, well, we shouldn't be in war. Well, you go tell that to the people that just voted a new constitution in and been liberated and have some freedom for the first time in their lives. I, I'm, I'm sorry about 2,000 deaths. I am. I, nobody wants anybody to die. But I want to tell you something. I, if we turn and run now as a, as a nation, we pull our troops out today. You better believe tomorrow they'll be on our shore coming after us again. Amen. Now, that's my perspective. You may not like to hear that, but I'm just simply saying, I, I want to tell you, sometimes it's hard to be positive when things are so negative. And so David is saying, hey, I want to tell you something. Hey, you may be looking at me long faces, but he's saying, God, lift up your countenance upon me. God, I need you right now. I believe it. You know, there are times sometimes as Christian people, we've got to, I like to, to state it this way, we're flying in the fog. We can't see. The clouds are surrounding us. We're, we can't see outside the windows. You don't know if we're upside down or right side up, but we've got to trust the instruments. And when the, the fog lifts and the clouds clear, we're in control with the tower, Brother Rick. For those of you who don't know, Brother Rick works as an air traffic controller. Amen. Then I want you to see finally God's peace. Would you notice that in verse number 7 and 8? Now, it's both... Yes, Thou hast put gladness in my heart. Now notice this, more than the time that their corn and their wine increased. David was referencing a time of jubilation in Jerusalem. There were times when there were festivities, when people came from all over the country to come and worship God during a time of proclaimed uh, religious festival. And it was a, a, a time when everybody was having a great time. And, and, and David said, I'm telling you right now, thou hast put gladness in my heart. Can you imagine? This is 24 hours in the coup. He doesn't know how it's all going to play out, but he knows the one who knows how it's going to play out. He said, I'm, I'm glad. And then David said, look at verse number 8. He said, I will both lay me down in sleep. I will, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only makest me to dwell in safety. Hey, you can buy the best bed in the world, but you can't buy a good night's sleep. Only God can give that to you. As we said last week, like David's looking up to heaven and said, Thank you, Lord. Good night. <laughs> and off he went. Now, let me just simply say to you tonight, there are times in difficulty in every life. You may be looking at one of those right now. I, I, obviously, we look at our prayer list. There, there are a number of names. There are a lot of people in our, on our prayer list tonight that are having some difficulty. Well, I've got to tell you, I thank the Lord for a church that will pray for its, its membership. I thank the Lord for, for people who say to me, Pastor, I pray for you every day. I thank the Lord for that. Because truthfully, you know, as much as we need physical support, we need spiritual support. We need God to be at work. Ms. Reed, aren't you glad that when you go to those chemotherapy treatments, you've got to have some people on their knees praying for you to get you through the other side? I've got to tell you, God is there to help his people. I'll be thankful when we get on an airplane on Monday night heading for Ireland. I'm going to have a church full of people praying for their pastor and his wife as they travel to hold some services for a missionary family out of our church. I'm glad for that. I need that type of support. It's good to know that we've got a God in heaven who cares about his people, but it's good that we can pray for one another. But let me just simply say, what we need, we need God's blessing upon our life. That blessing doesn't necessarily always exhibit itself as, as just everything is rosy, everything is fine, there's no problem. Sometimes we have to go through those difficulties because God then stretches us and he enlarges us. Causes our faith to grow in a time of trouble. We look to the Lord. He takes us down that valley and brings us up the other side. May we trust in the Lord tonight. May we learn from David's psalm, Psalm 4, on how to put our confidence in God. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Father